Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all? Um, welcome to our November ACNC webinar in which we're going to be looking at how charities can showcase their work and projects and programs through the 2020 Annual Information Statement. My name's Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Tim Liu from the ACNC's reporting and red tape production team. Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Now, as is always the way, before we kick into gear, we'll just get some housekeeping out of the way. Um, if you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone, call the number listed in the email you'll have received upon sign up, and you can put in an, uh, the access code and listen to the webinar that way. You can also type a question at any time through the webinar. We've got Matt and Gulna helping us out and responding to uh, questions and queries. We'll try and answer all the questions as they come through, but if your question isn't answered, uh, feel free to send us an email uh, at the end of proceedings and we'll get back to you. If you want to send an email through, it's to education at acnc.gov.au. Um, a recording of this webinar as well as the slides and the presentation will be published on the ACNC website within a day or so. As always, we'll send out an email with all the website links featured in this webinar so you don't have to scribble down everything frantically as we go through. Um, we've also got a handout uh, that you will have received and have access to uh, through the GoToWebinar sort of panel there. Uh, it's got links to some of the sites that we'll mention today and some of the pages on our website that would be worth looking at uh, and that are relevant to what's going on today. Um, Finally, we really value your feedback. If you've got any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, let us know in the short survey at the end of today's session. So, it says clicking on a button and hoping things work. There you go. What's on the agenda for today? Um, look, the first thing we're going to cover uh, is we're going to look, I guess, a little bit more from a wider perspective um, and explain the ACNC's role of uh, maintaining, protecting and enhancing public trust and confidence in charities and the charity sector. Um, and in that, how the annual information statement plays a crucial role in, in those efforts. Um, our focus here obviously is going to be on the 2020 annual information statement or AIS as we'll shorten it to through our session today. Um, and it's the 2020 AIS that charities can use to showcase their work through their normal question answering processes, I suppose. Um, we're also going to focus in through the 2020 AIS on the program section. Uh, we're going to look at what a program actually is. Uh, we're going to work through what the program section of the AIS asks. Some charities may have already used uh, our, our program previewer on our website, or they may already know about it. Um, it's going to get a, a well today in the webinar as well. We're going to um, go through things and, and, and have a look at how things work there. Um, what else? What else are we up to, Tim? Yeah, so um, as part of that, when we go through the webinar, we'll take you, oh sorry, the preview to, we'll take you to through some of the questions that your charity will be asked um, mm. and go through the ways that which you, in which you can answer the question to best showcase, you, you know, your charity's work, its programs and its efforts. Um, we'll also have a look at the ACNC Charity Register, uh, which is, and in particular, we're going to show you how your programs display on each of your charity records. So that's an important part of showcasing what you do and will help the public, us and donors to understand your charity's programs. So we've got a bit to do and a bit to cover. Um, as a starting point, we'll look at our role of um, maintaining, protecting and enhancing public trust and confidence and how the AIS fits into those efforts. Um, look, when the AIS was established, uh, it was established under the ACNC Act. That act contains, or contains actually, three main aims. More formally, they're, they're called objects um, to guide the, the ACNC's efforts. Um, one of them is to, as we've said already a couple of times, maintain, protect, and enhance public trust and confidence in the sector through increased account accountability and transparency. Um, as the charity regulator, this is, of course, a, a vital part of our work and, and, and what we do. Um, we achieve this in all manner of ways. Uh, a couple of the ways, I guess the more noteworthy ways uh, or things the ACNC are doing in the near future, one of them is mentioned here on screen, a series of DGR reviews for charities uh, that have DGR status. For more information about that, that's uh, you can go to acnc.gov.au uh, forward slash DGR reviews. 
We've also received some funding in the most recent federal but government uh, federal government budget uh, to carry out a, a series of, I guess, field-based risk reviews on charities around Australia. Um, got ahead of myself there. There's an update on on that as part of the uh, a part of a media release uh, we released last month. If you go to our media section um, and have a look, there's some details about that. Um, it's also in the um, in the handout that you will receive today as well, um, a, a link to this uh, media release if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Now, so I don't get ahead of myself, I'll, I'll click this and, and Tim can have a well, start us in on the annual information statement. Yeah, thanks Chris. So as Chris has mentioned, uh, one of the most important ways that we will maintain, protect and enhance public trust and confidence in the sector is by having charities report to us annually through the annual information statement or the AIS. Now, most of you have already completed an AIS in the past, but for those who haven't, the AIS essentially just contains questions about a charity's activities, programs, operations, and some basic financial information. It also contains a range of questions that we ask on behalf of other regulators across Australia to reduce the reporting burden for a range of charities. Now, um... As you know, or as everyone knows, information provided by charities through their AIS um, can appear on the ACNC Charity Register. Um, and this is, I guess, where the 2020 AIS comes in. Um, we've made some changes and some, some tweaks to the 2020 AIS to give charities uh, a great chance to promote their work to, to even more people, uh, even more members of the public. Um, Tim, are you able to, I guess, explain a little bit about what we've done with the 2020 AIS and, and particularly the questions that focus on, on charity programs? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. So um, focusing on the programs, what we've done is remove a whole range of questions that previously asked charities about their activities and instead ask questions about a program. So when our commissioner has gone out to speak to charities, he's his understanding and learning is that charities speak in the language of programs. This is what I do rather than a, an activity sort of discussion. So we're defining a program as an activity or service that a charity runs to achieve its charitable purposes for its beneficiaries. Um, although we previously sort of asked about, you know, activities, we're moving the focus to programs because we think it will give greater granularity and information to the public to us and to anyone who's interested in donating to your charity. Now, oh, and also just to, I guess, clarify on that too, although it's, I know it's up on the screen here, but when we mention beneficiaries, beneficiaries are, I guess, th those you aim to help if we're talking about people, um, uh, certain sections of co the community. Um, so that's, I guess, what a program does. It sets out to help beneficiaries and beneficiaries are those that you aim to help. Um, we've, uh, I'm just having a look here, the, the ACNC has always asked questions about charity programs through the AIS. In 2020 and beyond, we're, we're doing this, uh, I guess, a little bit differently. Um, what are some of the differences? What, what are some of the things we're going to be looking at doing, Tim? Yeah, so I guess the, the main thing we've done is when we talk about programs, we've introduced a, a taxonomy. So it's a taxonomy of a charitable classification. So in the past, we asked charities to report on their main activities. There were about 26 different options that charities could um, select from. We're now using a taxonomy developed by our community. It's called Classy. Uh, and that has been developed specifically for the Australian NFP sector. So Classy uses easy, relatable language to describe a charity's programs. And there's over 840 different classifications that charities can use to describe their program. Now, with, with Classy, uh, and I'm, we mentioned our community here, many, many people who are with us today have probably heard of our community. Um, so again, it's th that emphasis on it being very much a, a, an Australian sort of a, a system or a, or, a, or a classification system that's suitable for the Australian sector and, and organisations in Australia is, is, is important. Um, 
you know, the, these systems and, and classifications that are used in, in Class EA are used by funders and, and by grant makers who support the sector. So it, it sort of means that there's a, 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 bit, a bit of a focus, a bit of an emphasis on, on everyone speaking the same language. Uh, in a way we, we mentioned, or Tim mentioned earlier on, the, the idea of speaking in programs, I suppose. So there's that idea of speaking in the same language. Um, now, the questions that are being asked in this section of, of the AIS, um, they're going to offer a really strong and a very sort of relevant real opportunity for charities to showcase their work because you'll be able to better describe it, better categorise it, and, and the descriptions are you know, easy enough language, down to earth, and, and you'll be able to go through and ensure that um, you can categorise it in a way that's it's easy to understand for people who may be uh, looking for information about your group on, on the charity register. Um, how are the questions, Tim, going to, I guess, prompt responses that are going to help charities showcase their work? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so there's basically five uh, different elements that we'll ask charities to report on for their programs. Uh, we'll go through that when we go through the preview or tool, but essentially we've, we've designed the questions in a way that are similar to what we previously asked, but that also provide enough clear guidance for charities when answering those questions. Um, and we'll show you as we uh, go through the preview tool soon. Yeah. Um, what it also does, um, what, what we've set out here is, is it gives charities the ability to showcase multiple programs. Um, and we, when we talk about it, it's, it's important to sort of emphasise this opportunity and this possibility of showcasing multiple programs. Um, charities can choose, I guess, how many programs they detail in this section of the IAS. They, they are compelled to, um, I guess, detail one uh, program as a, as a minimum. Um, they can detail, Is it? it's up to 10, isn't it, Tim? Uh, yep. Yeah, up to 10. And the more programs you detail, this is, I guess, common sense, but, but the more programs you detail, the more information that and context that will provide potential supporters um, and, and members of the general public and funders, philanthropists, grant makers, all that, about your work and, and all the bits and pieces that you do. So that's an important aspect of, of what's being done here as well. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick switchy screen and we're going to go into the program previewer. Now, the program preview, we can access it on our website here, um, acnc.gov.au forward slash program previewer. And we've provided this little bit of context just before we get into it. So um, there we go. We're switching over. Beautiful. Now, what this is and what you can see on the screen, and Tim's going to sort of talk to this a little bit more, is uh, our program previewer. It's a preview of the section, the program section of the annual information statement. And that allows and that allows you to go through, get familiar with this section, but also perhaps have a have a bit of a check out about some of the classifications and some of the bits and pieces that it involves. But I'll stop talking for a second. I'll I'll let uh, I'll let Tim do a little bit of the navigation here. Thanks, Chris. So the first thing that we'll ask charities to provide is the name of their program. Uh, what we've found is that charities normally have a, a way that they frame a program. So it might be to do with ear health or something like that. So you, you might just have a program for dogs called, um, let's say, dog rescue service. Now, if, you're, if your program doesn't have a formal name, what, what do you do? You can just give it a name, can't you? Yeah, we recommend that charities just provide program one, program two, program three, for example. Um, yep. The reason that we need you to uh, name your program is that so charities or the public can actually identify which of your programs you have uh, when they search you on the charity register. Yep. All right, so All then right. I'll take sorry. you. Oh, sorry, I was, I was going to say now we've, we've given the name, this is good. Classification. Um, now, this is where the 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 classy and and the taxonomy sort of comes into play a little bit, yeah. Yeah. So this is the uh, I guess the newest bit, but we think it's pretty easy. Uh, yeah. So when you click on the button, there's two ways that you can classify your program. There's a left hand side. There's a, a search bar that you can use, or you can use the right hand side. 
uh, to search through the classifications. So one of the first things I might just do is use the classification search bar. Mm. We have developed a keyword search algorithm. So all you have to do is type in a particular subject. Uh, for example, if you work with the homeless, um, mm. you type in homeless, and then you'll get a range of results that show possible outcomes or possible classifications you could select. If you so want it's going to down to the level, isn't it? It's going from just saying, as you've put in there, homeless, it's then giving you those options that allow you to maybe dig down that extra level, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's the extra granularity that we think that will provide charities with a better opportunity to explain what they're doing um, and who they're helping. So, yeah. for example, if you want to select homeless services, you can click on that and there'll be a detailed description of what that classification involves. Um, so you can read through that. If you don't think it really applies to you, you can move on to the next option. You know, there's soup kitchens. You might think that's a more relevant classification for your program. Um, and once you're done, you can select or click on the select icon here. The other way you can do find a classification is just to search through the right hand side. So you can just click through the main categories here and find one that may apply to you. So in this example, if we're looking at the environment, uh, you click on the icon or the text here and you can see there's a range of drop down options. Um, you might, your charity might be involved in climate change um, and you can then click on that, read about it and select that as your program classification. Uh, yeah. Now it's important to note that there, you can only have one program classification per char per program, sorry. So you can't select two classifications. Yeah. And, and with with this, I mean, either way you approach it through the keyword search or through the the, the options on the right hand side. Again, the whole idea of um, being able to make these choices and and being able to look at, I guess, from a wide perspective and then delve down that little bit is, as you say, Tim, to give that little bit more detail, that little bit more granularity to to the information that will eventually be displayed uh, on on the charities page on the charity register yeah yeah definitely yeah now next next one we've we've decided that next we've one. got a we've got a climate change uh, climate change uh, classification happening we we scroll on down beneficiaries now um, the ACNC in the past has asked for information about beneficiaries in in previous AISs so there's sort of nothing hugely new here but um, as we've said before, beneficiaries are those who your charity's programs seek to help. help. Um, now that, again, might mean certain people, subsections of the population, certain parts of society or, or the world. Um, now, responding to this question, this will probably look pretty familiar to people who've done an AIS in the past. It, it's, it's relatively straightforward, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, Chris. We've kept the beneficiaries identical to previous AISs with the exception of two new categories, the animals and the environment. So they haven't been previously available as uh, beneficiaries, but they now are. So mm -hmm. as Chris mentioned, um, you can scroll through the beneficiaries list and select the categories that apply to that particular program. You can select more than one option here, uh, but generally we recommend if you've got five or six, you know, different beneficiary groups, you might consider general community in Australia just because that's probably more representative of a charity's beneficiaries. Um, if a charity selects another beneficiary, which shouldn't be that often, you'll be asked to provide some additional narrative on that. Um, yeah. But in this case, we you could say that if your charity's program relates to climate change, it would either be the environment uh, and possibly just the general community in Australia. Now, notice here, and probably people have noticed too, you, you, now you can tick more than one box here, can't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've, we've kept that um, possibility open. We you do recognise that, you know, there's lots of beneficiaries for particular programs. And uh, look, unless you need to tick five or six boxes, um, it's probably better to keep it to a, a relatively smaller number um, just for, I guess, ease of use. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, now that we're asking um, questions about a charity's program, we should be able to narrow in a bit more in terms of who each program helps uh, and that should hopefully provide some additional clarity on the charity register. Yeah. Um, now just before we go any further with this too, just a reminder, there's um, as is usually the case, there's some great guidance for completing this section of the actual AIS um, and other parts of the AIS uh, on uh, the ACNC website in our um, AIS hub. Um, the hub includes our guide 
uh, and that's got detailed guidance information on each question in the AIS, including these programs questions. Uh, it's also got a checklist that you can go through to ensure that you've got all the bits and pieces you need before you start working on the AIS. So you've got all the documents you need, the information, all that sort of stuff. Um, so the AIS hub, if you go to acnc.gov.au forward slash 2020 AIS hub, um, you can go and have a look and, uh, and get a bit of an idea. If you are using the program previewer as well, um, there is a, a specific section of the AIS guide that relates directly to the questions that you will see in the program previewer. That's detailed at the top of the program previewer page uh, that you're currently looking at right now. So um, you'll be able to link directly to that. So oh, here we go, we're gonna zoom back up, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the 2020 Annual Information Statement Guide, refer to question eight under the Charity Program section of the guide for more detail on this section. So this will, that part of the AAS guide will be directly relevant to the questions that you see in the program previewer. So um, now, as we zoom on back down again, um, program location. So that's pretty straightforward for the most part, but there are maybe a couple of things to remember here, aren't there? Yeah, so, this is probably one of the, the bigger changes we've made in terms of how a charity will report to us. Uh, for those of you who previously submitted an AIS, you would have just been asked to tick a box next to the state or territory that your charity operates. And maybe if it operates overseas, you, you tick that box and provide us with some uh, of those countries that you operate in. We've actually made it easier now for charities to report on their program locations and recognising the diversity of where the program operates, we've actually expanded the way that charities can provide the operating location to us. So okay. it's now a text-based search result. So if you click on add location here, charities are able to provide, you know, a range of operating locations. You can be as specific as you want. You could specify a street. Uh, you could even specify a suburb. Or yeah. if you're operating across Australia, you can just say Australia. So what I'll do is just take you through a couple of examples here. Um, so if you operate, if you wanted to provide a street address, you could say 10, uh, let's say 10 William Street in Paddington, that would be a street address. Uh, you then click on add in the, another location to provide us with a second one, for example. You can then select Sydney as your city. You could also choose a landmark, so the Great Barrier Reef. And then if you were operating across you know, numerous, I guess, states, you might just select Australia. Yeah. Now, charities can provide a range of operating locations for each program. You're not limited to just one, but we've given charities a lot of flexibility uh, to report on their program locations. So if um if a charity is say say a charity is located there at 10 William Street in Paddington, but their program, whilst it might operate from that that operating base, that might be their their shop front, their building, but maybe that program that they have covers two or three different suburbs in and around Sydney or New South Wales, they can also just add those in, can't they? And that will provide another level of detail, yeah? Yeah, definitely. And you can also um, report by council area if you'd like. So oh, no, um, handy, yeah. there's a Melbourne City Council, um, yeah. or here, Melbourne yeah. City, for example, um, yeah. that you could select from. So, it, you know, if you're operating in a specific local government area, that might be easier than specifying four or five different suburbs. And there'd be plenty of charities that would be operating within maybe one or two local government areas in, in their region. That would be a very handy way of being able to describe it. Yeah, um, definitely. With, now, we can sort of see just underneath there a little tick box. It says, this program is run outside Australia. So um, if your program is run outside Australia, what do you need to do? Yeah, so the... Uh, you, by ticking this box, you'll be asked to provide the list of countries that your charity operates in. It's similar yeah. to the 2019 AIS in that you can just search for particular terms like Korea, sorry, um, and just select that and keep on going. Um, yeah. The operating locations above here are only for Australian locations. So 
when we talk about overseas countries, we're only looking for the name of the country. We, no, we don't need the detail of where in that overseas country your charity operates in. Uh, yeah. And the other thing that we've allowed is the ability in the AIS for charities to select that they operate online. So if your charity is just a virtual charity, it doesn't really have a physical presence. In the AIS, there'll be a similar tick box right here, um, just mm. to allow you to say that you operate online. And if you tick that box, what does what comes up on screen? Does anything come up on screen? Uh, no, no, no. You just tick that box saying you operate online and, and that's all that you'll um, be asked for that particular okay. segment. Cool. cool. Now, the last one, and again, you can probably just see it peeking at the bottom of the, bottom of the screen there, program web link. Um, now, you can enter, obviously, your, if you've got a specific spot on your website that um, maybe covers this program, um, you know, a specific page or a specific bit of information, um, you can put that there. You can be as detailed as you want. If you don't, um, you can maybe just put your general website, your homepage, um, uh, something like that, something that you feel that's sort of relatively relevant to the program or the work that you do. Um, now, if uh, charities don't have a website, where what should they, what can they put on, uh, Tim? What, what would we sort of be happy to have listed there? Uh, we just recommend that you leave that blank. So when we okay. ask for the details of a charity programs, all of these locations, beneficiaries, classification and name are compulsory but the mm. web link isn't. Uh, we recognise that, you know, not every charity might have a specific web link for each program. Yeah, and also too, if, if you haven't, if you haven't got a, a website or a specific web page or something like that, but maybe, you know, and Tim will correct me here, so I stand correct if I say this, but you might be on a social media, you might have a, you might have Facebook, or you might have an Instagram page. You, you, can, you can put that as your web, web link as well. Is that an option? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Cool, cool. So that, that's, look, this is pretty much, this program preview, as we've said, that pretty much covers this section of, of questions. Um, as you can see, there are some bits that are familiar and pretty similar. There are some bits that we've made a little bit of, a little sort of a few alterations and a little bit of change to um, ensure that we accommodate um, the, cl the classy uh, taxonomy, um, or that's pretty straightforward language and, and pretty, you know, plain, plain speaking, I suppose, too. So um, importantly here to the, the program previewer, um, feel free to go and have a look at it. Feel free to go and have a bit of a, a play around, take it for a test drive. Um, when you're done with it, if you have, say, got a program and you've gone through and you've found all the bits and pieces that you want and you've got a nice description, important to remember that the information that you put into the program previewer does not go across to your actual AIS. It's like a practice, this is like a practice tool. So what you can do, and uh, again, you can probably just see down the bottom there, we've got a print button. Now that print button, it allows you to, uh, now it's, it, it can, you can save a PDF, can't you, Tim, as well as print it out? Oh uh, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Just like um, any other web page, you could definitely do that. So, um, you know, if you've done done a, a bit of work and you've gone through and you've pretty much happy with all the bits and pieces that you've selected, the categories, the descriptions and all that sort of stuff, save it up, get it in a PDF, print it out. And then when you go and do your AIS, that's another little bit of information that you've got in front of you. It'll allow you to whip through this really quickly and with a, with a minimum of fuss. So um, now that's the program preview. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to, toddle back to have a look at the slides again. Um, now that means I have to take control again, doesn't it? Goodness me. Let's see what we can do here. Alrighty. There we go, look at that, beautiful. All right, cool. Now, that's the program previewer. So from there, he says, trying to get things working, here we go. That was one part of the equation, the programs part is sort of one part of the equation. Um, we hope that that little bit of a run through has helped you out and provided a little bit of clarity, a little bit of context on what's going on. Um, now the charities providing information through the program section of the AIS, that's sort of one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is how we at the ACNC are gonna display this information and display it in a, in a prominent and, and good way. And this is where the charity register comes in. Again, 
you'll be familiar with the charity register, I would think, acnc.gov.au forward slash charity. Um, it, it contains information about Australia's registered charities. Now, um, it's free for members of the public to search, available to everyone. The information is provided to us through charities' responses to the AIS. Um, now, though, by of course, by law, we can only publish certain types of information on the register. So um, that, that's an important caveat to remember. Each listing on the charity register shows details about the charity, its, its purposes, uh, names of the people involved running the charity, uh, financial information, annual reporting, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's used already in all manner of ways. Um, and it's, it's already available, it's already up there. The information that charities provide to us through the AIS, through the AIS already appears on the charity register. So um, we we know that members of the public, um, funders, um, uh, possible grant makers, perhaps philanthropists, um, possible volunteers, all go have a bit of a look at the register um, and I guess try and find out a little bit more about some of the groups on there, some of the charities on there, some of the work that they do. Um, so with all that in mind, how are we going to display this information through the that we've gained through charities answering these programs questions. Um, how are we going to help sh showcase this information to potential supporters and donors and, and volunteers? So look, what we're going to do is again, we're going to do a quick switchy screen and uh, Tim's going to show us a little bit of an idea about the alterations and the changes that we're making to the charity register in the very near future and how things will look. So as you can see on the screen, we're, we're ready to go. I'll let, I'll let Tim do some talking. Yeah, thanks Chris. So this is a, a live example uh, from a charity called the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales. So if you scroll down onto the overview page, you'll see that all the charity programs are displayed here. So this charity has provided us with 10 different programs, which is the maximum available. If a member of the public or a donor wants to see more information, they click on this link and they're taken to uh, the 2020 AIS page. So that'll contain all the beneficiaries for each of the programs, as well as further information on the program locations and classifications. Now at the moment, uh, the members of the public or donors cannot search based off a charity's program. However, we're working to improve the search functionality of a website to include this. So in the future, our hope is that anyone can log onto our website and say, I want to look for a charity that operates in a certain area and has a certain classification. So for example, I want to help an animal shelter that operates in Goulburn. Yes. What we expect is that the search will dig through all the programs provided and we'll be able to provide a tailored list to each member of the public with you know, their relevance, and then that'll help to drive transparency in the sector, but also provide charities with the opportunity to showcase what they do, where, and maybe even increase some of their uh, revenue to better achieve their purposes. We can, we can already just by the, that description and, and what we see up on the screen there, we can always already sort of start seeing how this could be a, a major benefit to, to charities. And charities, registered charities have to do the AIS. So the information that they provide through the AIS already appears on the charity register. So it's, this isn't any like extra work or anything for this, for this benefit that will occur. This is the work or the, or the effort that you would normally put in to do your AIS. Um, maybe a little bit extra work just to make sure you've got the information about your programs and all that. But that will, when the time comes, that will appear on the charity register. And that tailored search is going to allow people to, um, I want to volunteer for, as, as you said, Tim, a, a, a group in Goulburn that does X, Y, and Z. And very simply, you can, you can jump in and you can see uh, it makes it very easy to get in touch with people, makes it very easy to, um, to I guess, narrow down your list uh, to provide some support or even just make a phone call and see if anyone's interested in, in gaining a volunteer or two. So this sort of tailored search is, is going to be a, a massive help um, for charities um, because the information that we will be gaining from them, that will be showcased in a, in a, in a, a I'll say a better way, um, to allow people to search it more easily. So um, we're going to, I think we might 
quickly jump out of there. Was there anything else on there, Tim, that you wanted to, to highlight? Uh, no, just just be aware that it may take up to 24 hours for the register to update with any information, but it is current and it will be up to date. Yeah. Um, now, oh, now one, one thing, um, I know you, you alluded to this, Tim, the, the work in just making these changes to the register is is um, ongoing at the moment. It's it's not done. People who enter their program information, it's not going to appear straight up on their on this on their page now. Yeah, so it will take a little bit of time for that information to transfer. It generally takes uh, less than twenty four hours. Yeah. Um, and as Chris mentioned, when we talk about the search functionality, we're hoping to have that developed hopefully within the next year or so, um, so yep. that you can try it out yourself and see what happens. Okay, cool. Um, now, we might do a quick switch over again and get back to get back to uh, my slides. Alrighty, okie dokies. There we go. Now, after all that, and we've, we've had a bit of a look through some bits and pieces, we've got some quick little helpful tips. Usually we go through maybe half a dozen we haven't really got half a dozen because we've only got probably three or four on this one because most of it was pretty straightforward and, and self-explanatory. Um, but the first tip that we would provide is that um, obviously that charities have to fulfil their ongoing obligations to us. Uh, that includes their their annual information statement. Um, really, that should you know, go without saying. But again, doing your AIS is a key part of um, both individual and collective charity transparency um, and, and really straight up just good governance as well. Um, what's our second tip, Tim? Yeah, so the second one is to really take advantage of the program preview that we've got on our website. Take the time to figure out the right classifications and beneficiaries for your programs. Um, doing that little bit of practice work now will help make filling in the AIS even easier. And you can even print it off to show to the board or any other responsible people if you just want a second opinion. But using that tool will really make things easier for you. Okay. Um, and the, the third tip that we've got is, um, again, just having, I guess, this attitude of, of using the AIS, using your, your charity register listing, um, which, you know, the AIS you're obligated to do, um, and the register listing, which is, you know, um, uh, free and open to everyone. Um, use it to best benefit your charity and to showcase its work and its programs. Um, don't be afraid of linking people to your charity register page on your website perhaps um, or, or pointing them to it. So to, just remember that, that's well worth well worth remembering. Um, now we, we've sort of reached the end of our formal presentation today. Um, we're again recording this webinar, recording and the slides that you're seeing the presentation, um, as well as the the run through of um, the register and the program previewer. That's going to be um, available on our website in the coming day or two. We'll again send out an email to those who've registered uh, with some links and references and that sort of stuff, as well as links to the recording. Now, before we do go, we we have had questions coming through. Matt and Gulnar have been typing away in the background, helping people out. Um, we've had some come through both before and, and during the session. One, one that we have been asked, I might um, sort of throw to Tim on this one, is um, when you're filling in that section of the, the program previewer, or the pro, sorry, the program section of the AIS, um, are you able to provide a program, say, with, I guess, the same classification, but different beneficiaries? Is that something that you can do? Is there sort of any limitations or specifics that you need to know about here? Yeah, you can definitely uh, do that, Chris. I guess the only limitation is that you're only able to classify one program with one particular subject. However, okay. there certain charities might want to sort of report differently. So the first program, let's say they're dealing with homeless again, might mm have their beneficiaries as only, you know, um, veterans and their families, uh, and then a location as a CBD somewhere. The second program might have the exact same classification of homeless services, but this one might be targeted towards those who are living in poverty. So we're definitely I, allowing charities with some flexibility to report on their programs. So if there's those subtle differences, they sort of cover generally the same ground, but there's subtle differences between maybe what some of the um, the objectives of, of a program are. We're, we're keen to hear that from a charity through their responses, yeah? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah definitely. Sorry. Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> no problems. Um, now, is there um, have there been sort of other, uh, I guess, you know, bits and pieces that have been floating around when when people have been looking at the the program preview and been looking at the program section of the AIS that um that we would like to or that you would like to emphasize tim or is it is there more just a general take some time over it uh type attitude yeah i think you're right chris so we definitely encourage any feedback uh, charity has in terms of how they've found providing the information on their programs uh, yeah. and we do have a 2020 ais survey uh, that we do ask charities to complete we yeah. want as much feedback as we can to I guess, understand any issues that are occurring. But at a, I guess, a broader sense, we are hopeful that it is a simple, easy process for charities to show their wares, for lack of a better mm. term. Um, but if there's any issues that you've got, you can always contact us and we'll be more than happy to assist you with them. No problems, no problems. Um, yeah, that, that, um, that AIS survey too, um, once you've gone through and done your AIS and, and, and completed the, the online process there. There's a link to that survey and it, look, it's it's relatively simple. It's a, probably about five to 10 minutes work. And I know that answering questions after answering already some questions can be <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of a drag at times, but um, again, it's something that provides um, us at the ACNC with some good information and, and a little bit of uh, direction on how we can make the process you know, continue to be more uh, streamlined, easier to do, um, and 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 op offer some sort of options for general comment from from charities about their experiences with the the process itself. Um, I, I think and we're going to be a touch early today, but this is all right because for many of you it might be lunchtime. But um, we might wander, we might wrap things up there, and we might. Um, we might wander off. Um, on the screen right now are some of the ways that you can stay in touch with us. Um, we've got the website, obviously, charitable purpose uh, e-monthly that comes out, webinars, podcasts, uh, and, and all of that sort of stuff. Feel free to uh, see where we are on, on social media, on YouTube, and all, all that sort of thing. Um, a big thank you to everyone who has who has wandered in and and registered and turned up today to enjoy uh, the webinar. Um, a big thank you also to Tim for leading us through um, parts of the programs and the rejig register and all that. Thank you very much for that, Tim. No problems, Chris. And I do hope that um, people attending did find some value and um, help in completing the program section of the AIS. And if, again, um, I was going to say thank you to, to both Matt and to Gulnar who have been answering questions. Um, if there's questions that you're interested in asking, go for it. We'll stay sort of around for a few more minutes just to make sure those ones are answered. Again, if they aren't, or if you've got something that you think about in two days time, um, that email address on the screen there, educationacnc.gov.au. Uh, feel free to uh, drop us a line there as well. So um, also, this is our last webinar for 2020. Uh, we would all like to thank everyone who's come along today, but also through the year um, for registering, for tuning in, for continuing to support this part of the ACNC's educational work. It's something that we um, sort of really appreciate and really, really value. Um, and also just thank you to everyone around the ACNC that has jumped in to share their knowledge, to help present, to provide information uh, on all the topics and bits and pieces that we've covered during our webinars uh, throughout 2020. We will have a uh, new, uh, I guess, a new timetable and, uh, and uh, new bits and pieces for webinars next year. Um, there being finalised and scheduled and all of that sort of stuff. Now, keep an eye on the website, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars for updates um, and to register as well and uh, to see what's upcoming. Um, beyond that, thank you very much to everyone who attended today. Thank you to Tim, to Matt, to Gulna, to everyone who's attended during the year. Um, have a great day. Stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Bye.